please welcome Luann Grissendine. Thank you all very much. I understand there's some signed copies of this out yes, for sale I in the lobby. If, if people haven't read The Female Brain and want to, um, it's out there in the lobby for any of you. If you want to have it personalized, I can do it um, after this. So thank you all for coming tonight. And um, this was a very interesting project for me, having done the, uh, the book and having done the research. And um, I think I think they did a fabulous job of it, don't you guys? I think that, you know. So I can't take very much credit for the movie since Whitney Cummings was just, she's just awesome in terms of being the script writer, the director. <laughs> she played me in the movie. And, you know, she just has an incredible um, gift for what she does. And I thought that, the, I thought, um, I had some of my favorites. I love Beanie Feldstein in it as, as my assistant. I wish I had Beanie as my assistant. <laughs> She's a doll. At any rate, I'm happy to entertain any questions. Yeah, I, um, I, I thought I just started out. Uh, it's not every day that a science book gets adapted into a romantic comedy. And <laughs> I, I was just curious, it occurred to me like, did you have agents out there selling it as a movie or? Not at all. You know, if, 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 are any of you writers in the audience? And, and, and you know kind of that business is they, someone will option your book and they don't even tell you who it is and your agent contacts you and says, you know, we have an option on the book, blah, blah, blah. And um, I knew from other friends that were writers that about one in 50 books that gets optioned ever even gets, you know, in anything made. So I had no, and they don't give you very much for it, you know, so I just thought, okay, this is never happening. Then they, they upped the option the next year, and then I think they, it turned out that they sold the option to Whitney Cummings or something, and then she called me up and said she'd like to get together with me. Could she come up to Sausalito and have lunch? So that was the beginning of it. She said, I would really love to, to you know, adapt this book in, on the screen because it's my favorite book. It has helped me so much. I love it. It's just, you know, it's my Bible, she said. It made me feel very, you know, she said, I want other people to be able to, just just the public who doesn't read things like this, but just to get them a, give them a feel for what's going on in the brain. And so I said, ah, yes, of course. <laughs> so that was the beginning of it. And um, about um, maybe, I think it took them about two years to do this. I think they shot it all, I think they shot it all in about two weeks. She must have been going absolutely crazy. And uh, she would text me her questions. I stayed on as a consultant and then every time they wanted to know, well, this is right, is this is right, is this how this works? And I had no idea how they were gonna put it all together and make it work. Um, but those of you, anybody in here in film, you know how I mean how hard it is to shoot this and put something like this together. So I was really proud of them for for the job they did. Actually, <laughs> amazing. So it's a. I assume that that Whitney Cummings consulted with you while she was doing the script. Or, or she um, she she had writ she had, uh, she wrote the script based on a lot of things, and then she sent it to me to, to kind of correct it for her. So I had it, I gave her back a corrected copy of the script, um, and I was trying to make it as simple as possible, but she said, no, 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 make it as complicated as possible. So <laughs> I, then I made it way too complicated, and then we had to bring it back. So it had some, it's had some back and forth, but. Were you around on the set? Um, no, they did a two week shoot in different, just like boom, 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 and you saw all the, cast they got I mean to get this cast for I don't know they I don't know what they spent on this movie but it was between one it was it was under two million it was about it was about in the one million it's really this cast you know they must have all worked for for SAG you know for the just for mm -hmm. but they uh, they must have all just been they shot it in Hollywood so I think they all live there so I guess that's how they did it but I thought they they chose a great cast mm -hmm. I think we can take some questions now. Uh, we do not have microphones for the audience, so I will probably be repeating uh, some questions. Uh, okay, first. Uh, I'd like to ask you, in, in looking at the characters in the movie, do you think back before, you know, before people became modern and got off the farms and in factories, everything changed, do you think that the differences between the male and the female 
brain would have been beneficial compared to today in today's modern world? Did you all hear that question about the modern world? And we don't live on the farms anymore. And would the male and female brain differences have been more advantageous on the farm than they say are in the city? Um, you know, I think that you can say that about, about a lot of things. I mean, let's, let's be clear, first of all, the male and female brain are more alike than they are different. After all, we are the same species, right? I think so. <laughs> so, and you know, if you think about those of us women, those of us females alive today are the great, 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 granddaughters of the most successful females at keeping helpless infants alive. So the skill set in the female brain that is tuned to keep helpless infants alive for up to four years, you know, they can live after four years without our help, um, but they don't, we don't just drop babies like a giraffe and they take off running in a couple of hours. So that skill set in the human female brain is really, really important. And those things that are specific to that, you know, our hormones, our, our being able to track the needs of a nonverbal infant, et cetera, et cetera, are perhaps more fine-tuned in the female brain than the male. But if, if you give a male an infant that he has to keep alive, you know, most males can do that too. So it's not it's not that, that it's not that you guys can't do that. You know, <laughs> at any rate, thank you for that question. It's very helpful. I think that it, it, the context that we live in is changing things. We don't have to have brute strength as much anymore. So I think females are not required to um, do heavy lifting as much. So the environments in which we can be successful in the modern context, in an urban context, rather than on a farm. Um, shifts the advantage, the male advantage, female advantage somewhat. So thanks for that question. Yes. I, I found this funny and sexy and sweet and informative. How does this get to be huge in winning Academy Awards and stuff? I think everybody should <laughs> Thank you. That's so sweet of you. <laughs> Thank you. He says everybody should be able to see this, etc. You know, I don't know. These are, you know, these indie movies have their have a, a, a life that's, um, you know, they get a, a, a limited release in theater, and now this this movie is on streaming, so you can watch it on Amazon, Netflix. So it goes in a couple of weeks. It went a couple of weeks after the theaters throughout the country go to streaming. It's just a current formula they have because there's no, you have to, the money that they spend for a Disney movie, the money that they spend for big movies is m hugely in advertising. And um, I have no idea. I don't know the Well, you know, I mean, for indie movies, I'm sorry to interrupt. You, yeah. <laughs> for indie movies, uh, one of the strongest things is word of mouth to tell your friends. And, you know, I think if, even if it is, say on you know streaming you know that you know they they can go and purchase the view and everything and that's going to get more numbers for the film it's a it's not our model obviously because we believe in theatrical but it's a possibility thank you for your kind yeah. thoughts we sell out monday <laughs> will you show it again what is, what is it? No, well. <laughs> She's a plant. She's a plant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we might oh, yeah. sell Okay, it. okay. Okay, if we sell out Monday, I'm going to hold you to that. We'll, we'll show it again. Okay. <laughs> it's like, a, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's you, know, our, you know, obviously it, it, it seemed to, it was ideal, I thought, for the Science on Screen series to do this as a program, especially since Luann is is local you know and it's just i mean also a fascinating story but you know behind this film uh, b becoming the kind of film it became so um anyway but uh you know we support all our films no matter how long we show them but how long we show them when we run them depends on uh attendance uh, totally on how many people come yes um, no. I'm Kyle Logan. I'm a student at San Diego State University. And about four years ago, I was diagnosed with adult ADD. And when I started taking Adderall for a supplement in regards to this, I realized a drastic decrease in the feeling of fighting myself constantly, which inspired me to pursue an understanding of biochemical mechanisms regulating human behavior and consciousness. 
uh, since worked at UC San Diego in the Skag School of Pharmacology and Pharmaceutical Sciences, working on neuropharmacology and small molecules interacting with our central nervous system. This year, I was taking a sociology course, and we just finished our uh, class on gender, and where I learned that a lot of the behavior that we're told is male or female is socialized at an early age. Now, given my interest scientifically in what I've been working on for the past four years, this brought a very like troubling question to me. At which point does is human behavior and consciousness a socially conditioned habit versus a biologically predisposed reaction? And how can you determine the difference between the two? Okay, I'll, if I can simplify the question just for a minute, just like what part of this is biology in terms of our gender and gender behavior and what part of it's cultural and, and how, we're, how we're raised and how our culture reinforces or um, you know, inhibits types of our behavior. And I think that's a great question, so thank you for that. And it's very well known, if you ask biologists what percentage of, of male and female behavior is biological, um, the psychologists will say, oh, it's about 50-50. About and then you ask the biologist and they'll say, well, you know, it's about 50-50. <laughs> so both sides, even though they seem they, like they might disagree, agree that a huge amount of our behavior is conditioned and reinforced or some is inhibited. You know, the, the boys don't cry. You know, so, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, boys' behavior that is both you know, reinforced for being a certain way and, and not in another way. The same things for females. So I think there's a mixture of hormones, behavior, genetics, and, and our culture. So I think, thanks for that, that question. It's both, it's clearly both for all of us. Thank you. Now, you had a question too. Well, I guess kind of along those lines, and I, I have a teenager, two months. Um, how do you think like, electronic devices are affecting the way that we think Asking about how much electronics and social and media are affecting so the brain. Brace. Now, are your are, do you have a son or a daughter that's? I have one of these, seventeen year old daughter. Are they both using um, video games and computer games and social media? The son. Okay, yeah. That I always get that. That's why I ask. I get that question from moms of sons often. And my son is somewhere in the audience out there. Hello, darling. Anyway, I won't embarrass you, but my son was very into to computer games from a very early age. And, um, you know, it turned out to be a passion of his. And he works in the industry now. So he's, it's, it's been, so, and he's um, a very kind, interactive, socially competent young man. So I didn't think that might be the case when he was younger and playing so many computer games. So I think that toys and, and what kind of play activities kids have access to at different generations, this just happens to be what's there for this generation. I think it can be too much of, too much of a good thing. There's gotta be some limits on it. They can't do it to the exclusion of their homework, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, girls can spend forever texting their friends endlessly. I mean, you know, it never, never ends. 11.30 at night, Two o'clock in the morning, they're getting texts from their friend. That's enough. Enough. They don't get sleep. So I think it's a, you know, it becomes a a a problem for their their sleep schedule often. So I mean, it can it can affect them certainly. But I don't really see that um, it's going to ruin them somehow. Or I guess it's not ruin or just like change their brain. They, they say too that kids so young are getting electronics and they don't play. So yeah, I think that. I'll give, I'll give an example. So anything that you do, repetition, repetition, 10,000 hours, right? It's 10,000 hours that you do something, you become an expert at that. So if they do 10,000 hours of that, they'll, they'll end up being an expert at that. Unfortunately, there's an opportunity cost to that, right? If they're just doing that, they're not doing other things. So I think it's like, it's like nutrition. You know, you need a balance in, in your daily activities and I think that makes it hard for parents because it's so it's so addicting they want that's what they want to be doing I hope that that helps but you know the the repetition 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 of just that to the exclusion of everything else is probably not a great idea anyway yes hi thank you <laughs> 
So I hear you kind of thinking and mute. She's, she, she's yeah, talking I, about the, really Me Too, the, Me we're, we're Too, the Me Too movement um, and also um, a lot of the kind of Twitter and kind of the male, male bad behavior um, and the, um, you know, the, the how men and women are going to um, go through the pendulum swing of our cultural shift right now. I think we're, we're, in, we're in a moment and I think the pendulum is swinging and there's going to be you know, some emergent things, hopefully emergent eventually, that will be more useful and make, um, make women's and men's lives in the workplace and together um, much more um, able for men and women to choose their own paths rather than having it be something that's men's work or women's work or that, you know, f family time is going to be shared more between men and women at work. I mean, I think that that's where things are going, and it's going there by fits and starts. And unfortunately, it's quite a, it's a painful zigzag course right now. I think it's been a very painful year and a half for most of us in this room, probably. Um, yes, rapid shifts. Um, so at any rate, I think that it's it's a wonderful time in a way for women too, because people are listening to women's voices in a different way, and you know. Thank goodness, it's about time, right? <laughs> here, here. Now, I, I actually, um, if it, it, it's better for the entire audience if questions are succinct, you know, get, get to them fairly quickly. Yes, you had your hand up for a while. I want to thank you for your book. It, was, it helped me raise my two daughters, and it freed me from a lot of the afflictions that they talk, that they talk about in the movie. Thank you. So thank you. Um, any chance you could give us a sneak peek into uh, what 2.0 is going to focus on? Hall of I. Anyway, um, th I'm trying. I mean, I'm trying to think about putting together a book for women in the 50 to 100 plus range because you know after you're 50, they yeah they just they just call us all postmenopausal women between 50 and 100 only one word for us but there's more phases in development than that so there's there's going to be pieces of all of that and um, I, I, I will uh, I'll keep you updated Thank you. <laughs> there's a man uh, right back there oh, with his okay. hand up yeah yeah hi I wonder if you could comment on uh, your thoughts on the differences between men and women in their interests in helping other people, even if there's no expected gain from it. He wants to know about the male and female version of helping others, even though there's no gain. And I, I don't think there's a, I don't really feel that there's necessarily a gender specificity to that. I'll give you an example. Um, I'll out my husband a little bit, but this morning he spent several hours on the phone with the wife of a friend in another city whose whose husband is in big legal trouble and he's trying to help him and that family figure out where to go from here and you know it's there's no he's just out of the goodness of his heart his, and, the, and his empathy helping other people that he cares about so i don't think there's any you know, women do that all the time with their friends. I mean, I have a lot of my swimming pool friends here, and we, we all hello. hello. We, we basically, you know, we help each other out all the time with problems or with advice or with with whatever we can help with. So I, I think it's a very human quality to really want to help others, and to get a very to feel, to feel honored to be able to help. I, I mean, don't you all feel really honored to be able to really help your friends and family, so I think it's not a gender-specific thing. Way back there. So in the beginning of the movie, there was that information about what happens in the womb and sensitivity and excess stimulation. Is there evidence that a child that might have experienced that pre-birth can um, unlearn or adapt successfully to that lower sensitivity? 
So her question is about the, the oversensitivity, that, that if really dramatic things happen while your mother is pregnant with you, that you can end up being wired in, a, in mal, maybe a maladaptive way, let's say. Um, and you know, there have been some very deep human studies of that that have to do with looking at a woman who had a child in war-torn um, Europe and the baby was, one of the children was born, let's say, um, after the war, a brother or sister, and then one of the baby, one of the children they follow, have followed for now, I think 75 years, they follow some of these people. And they, ones that were, their mothers were pregnant during time of war and incredible stress and malnutrition and just are, are um, much more sensitive in some ways and have, um, actually end up having cardiovas more cardiovascular diseases and more diabetes. So there's, there's an interesting correlation between, with that. It's, they're very, you can imagine those are almost impossible studies to do in the human population because they're, they're, they have to take something as dramatic as war-torn Europe, where, the, where, the, where bombing was actually happening in those cities. So um, those are not studies you can repeat, replicate very much. So, they know that it does have an effect, and the, your question is, I think that if you can ameliorate some of that, um, that trauma would mean that you would have a sensitivity to keeping that person's life less stressful, better nutrition, um, better sleep, all the things that would be helpful to any of us might be even more important for someone who was um, in that kind of way, quote unquote, traumatized in the womb, if you will. I hope that's helpful. Yes. Have they optioned the male brain? Have they optioned the male brain? Well, like you said, it would be um, <laughs> no. It's the question. I, I was, you know, I think that at, maybe at this point, you know, with this whole movement, I mean, maybe people will be interested. I would love to see someone take it on. It might be a a, a big one to take on, but I'll keep you posted. It's, uh, yes. Um, she's wanting to know if the neural pathways in the brain change, you know, when the culture changes. For example, you know, we, I think we've had a huge cultural change in the last 18 months in this country, and it's just been, you know, shock wave after shock wave, day after day for many people. And um, um, there are some studies that show that people's cortisol levels are up, people's uh, ability to sleep is down, people's um, uh, nerves are on edge, so to speak. And so, of course, things in your culture do affect you. I mean, think about what it's like to live in Syria in the last 10 years. I mean, the, the answer is it, it changes all parts of you um, when, when there's trauma going on. Ours is probably a first world problem, and so we, uh, it, it's all relative, I guess, is the point. Yes. I'm curious if um, consistent, intense exercise produces the same type of cortisol stress that other types of stresses do. Did you say exercise and what else? I'm just, I understand that stress on your body that could be caused by exercise could produce cortisol. So I'm curious if it's similar to the type of stress that the cortisol that's produced when you have different types of stress. So it, cortisol is a really, you know, it's, part, it's from our adrenal glands, and the adrenal glands, you know, are kind of the fight and flight place where you're, where if you, you, you know, if a tiger's going to catch you, you're going to have your adrenal glands pour out a whole bunch of cortisol, and you're going to be able to, you know, ec have all of your muscles ready to escape. Um, and exercise is a you know, a tiny bit, a, a teeny bit of that type of stress, and it's it almost, um, so a lot of studies show that, so exercise can kind of immunize you against other kinds of intense stresses in your life. So that's why people say that exercise or doing a certain amount of exercise, maybe not the extreme forms, but doing regular exercise is really, really helpful to kind of slightly immunizing you against other large stresses. That's the current concept at least. Yes. I just wanted to express so much gratitude for, I've had 
18 concussions since the age of five. And um, what they didn't know was, you know, my ANS was completely affected. And it took 35 years for somebody to figure that out and recalibrate that. And so watching this and understanding the rewiring and working with the placebo effect and Joe Dispenza, um, like this just resonates just so much. And I'm so grateful for you. Well, thank you very much for that. And um, good luck in your rehabilitation. I know it's a long haul, but it takes a lot of courage, yes, okay. <laughs> Way back there. What inspired you to make this line of research? Um, what inspired you What for inspired this me in this line of research? Uh, so, you know, um, I started as an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, and kind of, you, know, you don't know why you get someplace and then you look back and you think, where did I start this? You know, Marion Diamond was one of my teachers at UC Berkeley in neuroanatomy. And uh, Frank Beach was, you know, the, uh, our teacher in hormones and sexual behavior. And so there were a lot of people in the early 70s when I was at UC Berkeley doing research in behavior and hormonal uh, stimulus to behavior. And I just really took to it and loved it. I thought that it was like, it was, it was enormously interesting to me. And I just carried it on after that for many years. I got then very interested in medical school and why it was that right around puberty, you know, the, the ratio of depression in childhood between males and females is one to one. But when you hit puberty, when all the hormones are raging, it ends up being two to one, females being twice as uh, frequently as affected with depression than males in, in the teen years. And the hormonal fluctuations of the menstrual cycle seemed obvious to me that that had something to do with it. So that's that. That's my kind of trajectory in being interested in, in hormones and behavior from, from back at age 18, I guess. So. Back row, maybe one last question there, yes. Uh, thank you for the wonderful research. My question is, from everything I just saw that was so exciting, but I can't take it all in and remember half of it, so I'll have to look at the book. Um, the question is, when you have differences in male and female biology, and then you have these, um, you have all of these different connections that are happening. Do you then have in memory a difference between the male and the female in memory because of all of the different things that have happening? So you mean that do males and females remember things differently? Well, I think I think there's a lot of lot of research that that shows that depending the way the way that you mostly lay things down in memory has to do with what was the emotion you were feeling at the time that something happened. And so if you're feeling something really deeply emotional at that time, it lays things down in memory in a very clear way. So it, if the male and female emotions are different about something, they probably will remember the same event perhaps very differently. So thank you for that question. And thank you all so much for your attention and, and coming tonight.